Harum du Jeden. Einmal. Balkans Calling. Voices from the region. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the podcast Balkans Calling. And today I'm talking with Professor Klaus Buchenau. Uh, he is a professor of Southeast and East European history at the University of Regensburg. We talk about his book, From Grand Estates to Grand Corruption, The Battle Over the Possession of Prince Albert of Turner, Texas in Interwar Yugoslavia. I am Jelena Jurgacevic Kisic. I am a journalist and I am a doctoral student under the supervision of Professor Klaus Buchino. Okay, uh, let's start from your title. I'm a journalist, you know, the titles are important. And uh, from Grand Estates to Grand Corruption. And uh, th- that is the main title. Do you find it uh, somehow provocative? Because honestly, I find it. Well, you know, when people read the word corruption, they say, Grand well, this corruption. is good. This is a scandal coming, right? Um, I cannot do much about this um, because this is basically so. Uh, what I could have done would be to avoid the word of corruption. But that was an impossible, impossible thing to do uh, for me because... This book is corruption research. It is about corruption. This is why it needs to have the corruption in the title. But this was basically because of the very subject of the book. It was not my wish to provoke anybody. And uh, can you tell us about more about the content, the subject of the book? Well, first of all, the book has a subject. It's very good. <laughs> I've written it myself. Very unusual. No. A very unusual Professor Buchino. <laughs> Well, you know, the book is about um, uh, the House of Turn and Taxis, uh, which is still today the greatest forest owner in Germany and which uh, possessed uh, large forests um, uh, which it had acquired basically during the 19th century uh, in Poland, Czechoslovakia and in Yugoslavia. So my book is only about these the the fate of these Yugoslav forests, Uh, about uh, 38,000 hectares, which they had acquired in the 1860s uh, from bankrupt Hungarian nobles. And then that was during the Habsburg time and everything seemed to be solid and for eternity. And the elite... um, thought it would remain the elite with all of its possessions for a long time. Then comes the First World War, and everything breaks down, and uh, the Habsburg Empire is split up into national states or uh, quasi-national states, such as Yugoslavia, which is, was in fact also multinational. But these new states uh, understand themselves as we would now call it post-colonial. So... Um, the heritage, the colonial heritage, especially when it is perceived as social injustice or as the dominance of the old dominant ethnic group, let's say of the Germans within the Habsburg Empire, this must come to an end in the view of these new national elites. So uh, what Yugoslavia does is basically to say that we will nationalize your property or we will uh, nationalize it on the ground that we will have an agrarian reform. So we will take the forests and give them uh, in a certain way to the to the pity peasants, which also need wood. Um, and we will also nationalize it as a reparation of what the Germans did uh, in our region of all, for all the devastations so as a compensation for the losses of the First World War. These were the two justifications. So um, then in the 1920s and then in the 1930s, the House of Turn and Taxes is constantly like uh, endangered by sequestrations, nationalizations, expropriations. What the book is about, that it shows this struggle and basically the instruments that are used um, by all sides in struggling for this, for these words. And what we see is that the House of Turn and Taxes, not having the old connections it had in the Habsburg Empire, uses um, bribery as one of uh, the key instruments. Um, it justifies this bribery 
um, because it says, you know, it's uh, the Balkans and to, but everybody does it. So we also need to do it. And it's also uh, justifiable since we are basically fighting against injustice. We are doing an unright thing, but in order to repair uh, an injustice, which is even bigger. So mm, why I wrote this book? This is basically because uh, by these sources I used, which basically come from the House of Turn and Taxes, and then I combined them with Yugoslav state sources and with the German uh, state sources from various archives, is that these documents describe very well the practices of corruption. So this is all the, so the reason why it ends with the grammar corruption, because I tried to find out the rules of how to can do you, right. Can you leave me something that I can ask? Because if you say uh, now everything, I cannot, I don't want uh, Excuse that. me, Jelena, um, <laughs> it's always bad to do a podcast with me, because I'm very dialogical when you talk in the kitchen, <laughs> then you speak much more than I do. But um, um, now I feel like a professor, and I forget that I need to take a break. People look at me, uh, but I don't even have to understand it, as because I am something like in trance. Uh, before this uh, recording this podcast, we talked uh, a little bit about, uh, let's say, the state of research and corruption in in Europe, and also you were, you were dealing in in your book about uh, your writing about some trends, about definitions, and how, how is it going, and and what what could could be. Uh, what could community could benefit from these researches? But uh, so how would you describe the current state of research on, on corruption in Europe? Well, first of all, I must say that I do um, historical research. So what I concentrate on is not the whole corruption research. But to me, it seems... Uh, that the great times of corruption research are behind us. So this is a um, field that is decaying, while the corruption as such is rapidly rising. Um, we have gone through times of crisis, and nobody really cares about corruption. Um, it is not, you know, without consequences, if people see that, for example, the European Union makes a deal on vaccines, which is absolutely done in an informal manner, and uh, nobody is able to press the president of the European Commission to publish anything. So this is the kind of demoralizing effect of crisis politics that they say, we saved your life so you don't ask critical questions. And this is the time we are entering. And this is also why, first of all, the anti-corruption mood of the society is going down. At the same time, uh, this mistrust of the institutions is going up. But this is not translated into ever more... Uh, corruption research, but rather into a strange science, uh, silence of, um, of science. So um, basically, many of the anti-corruption efforts, which were also backed by science, they have failed. Um, many countries have not really managed to improve greatly, at least when we look at the Corruption Perception Index. Um, and we see also that some things that were considered like um, paramount in corruption research, that, for example, countries cannot get rich if they are corrupt, that they sort of do not really work. When you look, for example, at the example uh, at China. So uh, corruption research is in a difficult state now. Um, but when you look only at historiography, it is still in the very beginning. We are not the social scientists who have a very long record of doing corruption research. And the historians have basically just begun doing this like 15 years ago. So there are many things still to work on. Um, and there is also the problem which usually appears when we talk about historians, uh, that they um, have a hard time in you know perceiving uh, the theoretical heritage of other, other disciplines. So... I personally know corruption historians who have no idea about the basic theories of corruption research as they were developed in the social sciences, who do not discuss them and just take for granted that they know what corruption is and then look for it in the sources. So on that level, there's also a lot of things to do. So when it comes to my narrow discipline, I guess that um, corruption research has 
still a good future. But in the general um, lines, I think uh, that the great times of the corruption research boom is behind us. Interesting. And uh, yeah, talking about material, I was just thinking while you, you were talking that this case, uh, Turn and Taxes, was in, in, that, in that sense grateful that the case ended up in the court, so we had a court material, but talking about historians explore the corruption, for example, in Balkans, it's somehow, it's sometimes hard because many cases did not end on, in the court, if I understood correctly, yes. Yes, uh, many cases did not end in the court, which is the case for many corruption scandals in the 20s, where the only material you can basically find is from the press. Um, and then you also have some things that went to court, but you will not find the court records in the archives. This is also something that happens. Um, and in my case, um, I also, there was a great uh, litigation, but I could not find there were any records in the archives about this um, litigation of, the, of 1935 to 1936. Uh, but what I could found, find was um, a great bunch of documents on this litigation um, from uh, the archives of Turn and Taxes themselves, who had just their own lawyers um, observing the process, uh, taking part in, in it, and, and writing down everything they witnessed, uh, bringing to um, the Regensburg Central all kinds of documents from this litigation. So this is how I could work with it. Yeah. And you mentioned it uh, at the beginning, but uh, you also wrote uh, Grammar of Bribery uh, uh, here in the book. So can, could you tell us more about that? And what yes. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the thing is that I'm something like... Um, transdisciplinary person. Uh, I know this sounds like a buzzword, but in this case, it's not really so because mm. I was trained as a linguist, rather as a social linguist, more than as a historian. And there I learned some a typical type of abstract thinking, um, which is, you know, to express how things work in language in abstract categories. Then I switched over to history because I've found that history has just uh, gives us more uh, broader possibilities to work with reality. Um, but I felt this constant lack of, um, of abstraction. They don't have it. Many historians are just storytellers. Uh, so um, what I did with this grammar is that um, I tried to formulate what I observed in the material as abstract laws behave like this and like that, and then it will work out. And then I created laws for every, you know, protagonist position. Um, uh, the rules for the, for the principle, for turn and taxes or for the Yugoslav state. Um, then you have the rules for the agent, for the lawyers working on the turn and taxes case, but also for the officials working for Yugoslavia, how they behaved really, uh, and what were considered the main patterns of behavior. And this is how I arrive at this type of, of grammar. Can you give us some hint what, what you would suggest, not really suggest, to some of the actor, actors, for example, like in, in, the, in that grammar? For example, like, what, 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 can you tell us one rule, one, what one principle should do or something like that? Just give us a taste of, the, of the, what you Oh, want. yes. Oh, yes, for sure. Um, for example... Uh, observing uh, what uh, the House of Turn and Taxes did uh, with uh, its various agents, that is the lawyers working on the Turn and Taxes case in Yugoslavia, um, I can see, for example, um, that they follow the rule, which is have somebody doing the dirty things for you but if the dirt becomes visible on the hands of these persons, then exchange them. Because nobody shall see this. And, you know, the doing of dirty things shall not translate into a bad reputation. Because once this happens, the agents will be absolutely powerless because nobody will be willing to work with them. This is part of the grammar. Um, or when you look at the agents, they also had their certain rules. Since they earned their honorariums from turn and taxes, they had an interest to uh, get a high 
a honorarium as possible and to get it um, as quickly as possible. So um, uh, they used parts of the honoraria uh, for bribing of Yugoslav politicians. And um, basically, uh, the contracts with the House of Regensburg, with the House of Ton and Taxes, were such that um, uh, they were to be paid the full honorarium only in case of success, in case of that they, for example, stopped the nationalization of the property. But they wanted to get things in advance. So what they constantly did was uh, to invent open hands in ministries. They say, you know, uh, until next week, we must bribe the minister so-and-so. If we don't do so, you will lose everything. And the House of Turn and Taxes, sometimes they pay. Then you see that the money flows not towards the ministry, but towards, for example, a house that one of the agents builds. Or um, Soran Taxes doesn't pay. And then you see nothing happens. So the nationalization is not proceeding. So um, the agent lied to the House of Turn and Taxes just in order to press them to pay money. So what the grammar does basically is formulate this into abstract rules to say, um, tell your principal about a corruption that doesn't exist. Invent corruption to maximize your income. You mm see? -hmm. And I, I have to add that the, the book is uh, written in a very appealing way. It's, it's like, uh, it was really in joy for me to read it, which is not so often the case when it comes to scores, book, especially in the field that I'm not so familiar with. Uh, and now I will use my, my right that is uh, given to me in this podcast uh, to use my native language and to ask something, Professor Buchino. Molim. Molim. Zahvaljujem. Ja nekako neprekidno dok da sam čitala tvoju knjigu, Stalno sam izlačila paralele sa sadašnjošću i tih paralela je bilo jako mnogo. Počelo od tih međunarodnih kompanija koji potlačuju domaće političare. Pitanje ekoloških pitanja i nekih poštovanja, nekih standarda koji se onda potom ne puštuju. Političara koji pokriva svakakve poslove svog sina i tako dalje i tako dalje. Jesi ti uopšte... Imao u vidu neku aktualnost dok si pisao, uopšte kao neku zadnju misu, da li, ili prosto si bio fokusiran na slučaju, uopšte ne misleći to, i da li misliš da će ljudi koji čitaju imati to negde u vidu, recimo, ja jesam, ali kažem, ko je tvoj stav o tom? Ne, 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 uopšte nisam imao. Ja sam tu ovu knjigu, ja sam pisao kao lud profesor, koji uopšte ne shvata i ne želi znati što se dešava na svetu. Ali zbog toga da uopšte nisam gledao na te paralele, težina tvojih reči je veća. Jer nisam ja to specijalno konstruisao. Ti to tako shvataš i verovatno tu ima nečemu o tome. Ali to meni nije bila moja namera. Ja znam da nije bila namera, ali pomalo je neko kako obeshrabrujeći čitati iz tog ugla, moram da ti kažem. Pa dobro, ja nisam hteo nikoga da obeshrabim i čak i moj kao kraj, moje zaključke, ja sam formulisao kao gramatiku, što znači kao pozitivna pravila za podmićivanje. Znači, to je, ne znam kako to da nazovemo, to je cinički optimizam, I mislim da to sebi može pozvoliti samo lud profesor. Ok, thank you very much. At the end, I, I want just to also to announce uh, your, uh, the, the Professor Buchino will go to the, some of the countries of uh, former Yugoslavia and present his books, his book in the, in the Institute. So we are, we are looking forward to it. And thank you very much for this conversation. And okay, until the next book. Thank you very much, Yelena. Our podcast recommendation this month, Kickback, the global anti-corruption podcast by the Interdisciplinary Corruption Research Network. Thank you for listening.